Um, for those of you who haven't had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Magnus Renfrew. I'm Director Asia for Art Basel. In May next year, we'll see the first edition of Art Basel in Hong Kong. The fair will take place from the 23rd to the 26th of May, uh, with a preview on the 22nd. We very much hope that you will join us for that. Um, I'd like to thank Tim Blum and Fergus McCaffrey for their help in organizing this morning's panel discussion, and to thank Absolute Art Bureau, who are the presenting partner for Art Basel Conversations. Um, I'd like very much to welcome our panelists this morning. Uh, we have Dorian Chung, uh, Alan Schwartzman, and Miko Yoshi Yoshitake. And it's my absolute honor to introduce our moderator this morning, uh, Dr. Alexandra Munro, the Samsung Senior Curator of Asian Art at the Guggenheim in New York. Dr. Munro has led the Guggenheim's Asian Art Initiative since 2006, and her groundbreaking survey textbook, Japanese Art After 1945, Scream Against the Sky, published in 1994, is commonly regarded as a seminal piece. She's the former vice president of the, of the Japan Society and was director of its museum. Uh, she's currently the trustee of the US Japan Foundation. Uh, and Dr. Munro has organized uh, many exhibitions on Japanese contemporary art. And next year, we're very much looking forward to seeing uh, the exhibition that she's currently working on uh, for the Guggenheim, Gutai Splendid Playground, which will be the first survey in the US of this very important Japanese uh, post-war avant-garde collective. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Alexandra Munro. Thank you. Thank you, Magnus. And we're so looking forward to the new incarnation of uh, art Hong Kong art, Art Hong Kong, that will now be um, Basel Hong Kong. So I hope to see all of you there in May. And thanks also to my dear friend Andras Santo for organizing uh, uh, all of the art best. Basel Conversations and the Salon, um, and to Absolute Vodka, our sponsor. Um, it's really an honor and privilege for all of us to be here today and to share our enthusiasm, our wonder, and our sense of gratification with you in this evolution of an extraordinary field. Um, we're here to discuss a really remarkable surge of interest in post-war Japanese art both in the market and at leading international modern and contemporary art museums in the United States and in Europe. We will also touch on Japan, which coincidentally does not necessarily follow this logic. Dorian, um, in an interview in Art in America, called this phenomenon a planetary alignment. Much of this interest has been focused on two groups, which you'll be hearing about a lot today. The Gutai Collective, active in Osaka from 1954 to 1972, which is primarily a paintings-based and performance-based collective, and Monoha, which Mika Yoshitake is really widely considered the leading American scholar of this movement, which is primarily an installation, site-specific, object-based, well, excuse me, sculptural-based movement, um, uh, active in Tokyo from the late 60s through the early 70s. Just to kind of locate us, um, I want to list the recent, current, and upcoming shows and events that have burst onto the scene, arousing all of this attention um, and causing us all to be here this morning. So, if I may say so, let's start with the Li Ufan exhibition, a retrospective at the Guggenheim Museum, which I organized uh, with Miko Yoshitake's very critical contributions. That followed not um, by uh, a by alignment, by planetary alignment, the extraordinary museum quality show on Monoha that was presented at uh, Blum and Poe in Los Angeles and then traveled to Barbara Gladstone Gallery in New York in 2012 with a museum quality publication as well. So congratulations to Mika and to Tim on that. I know that was a labor of love. At the same time, you had a massive retrospective of Yayoi Kusama um, that was opening and touring uh, Madrid, Pompidou Center, the Tate and the Whitney. Um, we also had this fall a retrospective of the fantastic neo-data Japanese artist Ushio Shinohara at the Dorsky Museum at the New York State University in New Paltz, also with a museum quality catalog. 
Meanwhile, Fergus McCaffrey of McCaffrey Fine Art in New York has been presenting an extraordinary selection of solo exhibitions, also many of them with superb scholarly catalogs of such major figures of post-war Japanese artists, um, Shiraga, Motonaga, Haraguchi, and the beautiful exhibition of Takamatsu Jiro that is on view um, at Art Basel now. Then we have Dorian's spectacular show, which has been the labor of many years of research, spectacular and a very innovative research on uh, the uh, uh, Tokyo Avant-Garde exhibition that recently opened at MoMA, uh, Tokyo 1955 to 1970, a new avant-garde. So if you haven't seen it yet, race up. Um, meanwhile, Paul Schimmel at MOCA um, has just opened a show called Destroy the Picture, uh, Painting the Void, which is a survey of post-war abstract painting with a strong focus on several Gutai artists that figure in this um, new kind of survey of uh, global um, uh, post-war art. That brings us to the Wachowski Collection, whose director, Alan Schwartzman, uh, really widely considered the finest art historian and advisor and director of many private collections, who has driven the Wachowski Collection in Dallas, all of which will be donated to the Dallas Art Museum to become the most active uh, collector of Gutai primarily, but also Monoha and other leading figures of the post-war Japanese avant-garde. Um, and there, um, the Dallas Art Museum is also, I understand, uh, developing an exhibition um, focused on two or three Gutai artists. Maybe we'll hear more about that soon. Meanwhile, in Europe, you have a show at the Tate right now on performance painting that features several Gutai artists and other artists of the Japanese avant-garde. Yoko Ono was at the Serpentine this summer. Are you getting the picture? Are you convinced yet? Um, and there's a forthcoming uh, retrospective also at the Frankfurt at the Schoen. And I have heard a rumor that François Pino at Palazzo Grassi during the Venice Biennale this summer will do an exhibition again focused on Monoha. So planetary alignment or meteor shower. <laughs> One way or another, this is sort of a cosmic event. So the question is why post-war Japanese art? Why now? What are the reasons for this groundswell of activity, international attention, and new scholarship? And I think before we answer this question and get into our discussion, I think it's worth pausing to reflect on the evolution and the state of the field of Japanese and more broadly contemporary Asian art in the West. And I think the rise of both are interrelated and not at all coincidental. So over the course of our conversations over the last week or so, as we were preparing for today's talk, we have looked over the histories of our respective institutions, Guggenheim Museum and the Museum of Art, Modern Art primarily, also the Hirshhorn and um, Dallas and other museums that um, Alan works with. And we find that there have been very specific and important moments of engagement. Um, uh, with Japan and with post-war Japanese art specifically, but somehow it's taken until now to build up a momentum. So the question is, what were those moments and why the momentum now? For example, at the Guggenheim, I recently was doing some research for my uh, upcoming essay in the Gutai catalog on the, Gutai, on, on the internationalism at, in the Guggenheim Museum. Dating back to 1955, we started at Guggenheim International Award. And Japanese artists were figured in that uh, international award and uh, attendant exhibition for every one of the annual exhibitions iterations from 1955 until 1971, Lawrence Alloway, uh, the great curator, British curator, who was at the Guggenheim in the heyday of the 60s, traveled to the Gutai Pinakoteca in 1963 and selected Yoshihara and Tanaka for the 1964 show of the Guggenheim International Award. Meanwhile, at the same time, Bill Lieberman and Dorothy Miller of the Museum of Modern Art, under the auspices of the International Council, were also in Tokyo and also in Osaka at the Gutai Pinakoteca and gathering an amazing amazing collection of works that was the centerpiece of uh, the new Japanese painting and sculpture in 1966 at MoMA. Uh, but following these early forays in the 1950s and through the 70s, and MoMA really was the, 
uh, trailblazer in those days across several departments, and we'll hear more about that soon. American museums, I argue, went into a period of isolationism and even retrenchment. Earlier initiatives that I've discussed were often aligned with the State Department and with cultural policies that were kind of fueled by uh, the Cold War, promoting American art as the bastion of freedom, individualism, and democracy in the arts. But America's spectacular failure in the Vietnam War, the um, oil shock, the ensuing fiscal crisis of the 1970s, and of course Watergate, um, really left the U.S. internationalist project um, in, in tatters and, and really quite exhausted and spent. So that by the early 1980s, U.S. museums, I feel, entered a period of uh, retrenchment and, and even parochialism. The art world was by no means parochial, but American museums during this period were. When I organized the first retrospective of Yayoi Kusama in 1989 in New York, and later um, the survey of post-war Japanese art, Scream Against the Sky, which I think we'll hear a little bit more about later, in 1994, there was no body of scholarship on modern and contemporary Japanese art in the West. No critical discourse or theoretical approach devoted to the creative production of art made by Japanese artists. There was no ready canon and virtually no connoisseurship of the kind that Alan is now offering to all of us and to his dealers, to his collectors. Modern art in Asia altogether lay far outside the bounds of conventional study in universities and also in curatorial practice in the museums. Uh, despite, and the infrastructure did not exist. Indeed, the existence of an infrastructure was barely imaginable. And the market in the West, I'd say, is virtually, at that time, non-existent. When I did the Kusama show, I think the entire value of the entire exhibition was probably under $100,000. And the objects in that show at that time included fabulous paintings of the Net series, for example, still to this day the highest value of Kusama's work, uh, works that are now in the collection of the National Gallery of Art in Washington, in Pino's collection. The entire show was under, I think the show itself cost six times the value of the work of art in the show. Um, Scream Against the Sky, when I was doing research, I'll never forget driving up to an artist's house outside Kobe, and he was there in the summer sun, hosing down the picture that I was there to see because the mold had grown on it and he had the garden hose on the painting. Um, so, you know, we've come a long way. Um, in the 1980s, the Pompidou Center mounted a truly groundbreaking show, Japon des Avant-Gardes, that uh, all of us remember and the book has been a textbook for us all, spanning a full century of Japanese avant-garde practices in all media, photography, film, performance, painting and sculpture. Um, also, in in 1989, again in Paris, the uh, great exhibition Magicien de la Terre opened um, that introduced contemporary art from the non-West in a new kind of global survey. Biennales started popping up all over the world, showing art from all over the world. So things by the early 90s had begun to shift. These efforts, including all of ours here, coincided with a radical shift in Western perspectives on modern international art history, which we're going to hear more about today, from, let's say, the singular master linear narrative to what Arjun Apuradai calls modernity at large, the possibility for multiple modernities in multiple geographic locations. Today at Yale, the art history program is not only uh, ordered around Western art history or regional studies, but it is what uh, uh, David Jocelyn, the chairman, calls a world art history. Um, museums, including the Guggenheim, are conducting curatorial workshops in Abu Dhabi, in New York, in Bangkok, on what it means to curate transnationally. Um, Re-evaluations, as Mika will be telling us, of uh, international art of the 1960s and 70s, performance, happenings, political art, site-specific and interactive art, um, lead us again and again, for those curious, to Japan's extraordinarily prescient and innovative practices, especially those of Gutai and Monoha. So we see a kind of shift. Um, Museum boards, 
uh, museum uh, directors, curatorial staffs, have finally realized that both the creative production coming out of Asia and the intellectual discourse surrounding contemporary Asian art demand their serious and in-depth commitment to stay relevant as an institution in the 21st century. So you have the Guggenheim, MoMA, and the Hirshhorn all hiring specialists in Japanese art and more broadly uh, Asian art and how to and sort of non-Western perspectives on contemporary and modern art. That's quite remarkable. And with Alan's representation, I would include the Dallas Art Museum as well. Collections um, have also seen this extraordinary opportunity that we can collect major work from the 50s and 60s at a fraction of what a very bad Jackson Pollock might cost you. Um, so this morning, we have an amazing panel assembled with deep expertise in Japanese art, which for the first half of the panel at least will be the focus of our discussion. They are what Mika calls the agents um, for this unprecedented focus on Japanese museum shows and market activity. And my job and yours when it comes time for questions is to probe them about the reasons, the background, and the impetus for this remarkable evolution and now remarkable confluence. Those of us engaged with uh, Japanese art you know, we all come from a kind of an existential background. So the existential questions before us are, we want to know how we got here, where we're going, and why it matters. So Alan, I'm gonna start with you. Um, why Japanese art now? What's, what's this all about? Well, I could speak first about how I came to it, um, which is through the activities of the Rachowski Collection, which I've been working on for 15 years. Uh, it's a collection of a man named Howard Drachowski and his wife, Cindy, who about 16 years ago um, was, was a typical collector of contemporary art, but had built a house designed by Richard Meyer that turns out to be a masterpiece of the architect. And when he finished it, he realized that he had built more than a, a house, but a serious piece of architecture, decided at that point that he wanted to become more serious about his art collecting, that eventually, when he passed away, he would leave his house and his collection to the Dallas Museum of Art, and consequently wanted to become far more serious and thoughtful about how he went about forming his collection. Because of the language of the house, we began collecting minimalist art, which was principally American minimalism. This was about 15 years ago when I started working with him. It was the, the kind of art that resonated with the environment that was to outlast the lifetime of the collector, and it was also an area of opportunity within the marketplace. As we were evolving that collection, or that part of the collection, it led us quite somewhat accidentally, but ultimately quite naturally, to look at post-war Italian art, which was an area that had been completely undervalued, that had, not, that had been off the radar screen of American uh, museums and private collectors. You would occasionally see a show of Lucio Fontana. You would occasionally see a slash painting in a collection. But the rest of that material was <coughs> invisible for exactly the reasons that you point out, that in this country, um, which led the world in the development of museums of modern and contemporary art, and in private collecting, which led the marketplace for that material, there was a bias toward American art in the post-war period. Mm -hmm. um, we, we happened to see resonances and relationships with the American art we were pursuing toward um, Italian art first in the 50s with Fontana, Manzoni, Buri, and then in the 60s and 70s with the Arte Povera artists who, whose work we saw as very interconnected with American sculptors of the post-minimalist period. And in fact, the original Arte Povera shows were not of Italian art, they were international shows. And mm -hmm. Richard Serra and Lawrence Wiener and so on were a part of that. That just wasn't visible in the United States. We still maintained this pro-American bias. Um, early on in this process, I would say probably about, it was more than 12 years ago, it was probably 13 or 14 years ago, uh, a dealer showed us an image of a very great and significant painting by Janis Kunelis from the early 60s, which was a, a breakthrough work that defined that moment when he's leaving painting and going into sculpture. And we went to visit the collector to see that painting. And as we're looking at it, there's this painting hanging opposite it <laughs> that starts to attract our eye. And we didn't know what it was. And we thought, hmm, is that a Manzoni? It had started 
aspects of Manzoni in terms of surface. It had aspects of Fontana mm -hmm. in terms of the surface having been broken, in this case, with large holes. And we learned it was from, by, by Shosa Shimamoto, an artist whose work we knew nothing about. It was quite a large painting, which was un uncommon for him, mm -hmm. um, meaning it was similar scale of a grand Fontana. And we're there to buy the, the Cunellis, which we were grateful to have the opportunity to buy, and we did. But we're asking about the painting with the holes across the way. And, um, and for us, it, it, it was probably for very superficial reasons that this looked interesting, but it did open a door toward wanting to explore this. And, and, um, and through the years, we, we, we started to look deeper um, into that material. And then it was really quite recently, in the last couple of years, that we focused on um, pursuing Gutai work and more recently, Monoha. Um, would you like me again to now specifically well, why I think you're on a wait let, let, me, let me circle back to you yep. because I know you have a lot to say about um, the opportunities that you, that you found there, not only the correspondences with Artipovera and some American artists, but, but then how you kind of fell in love, well keep going, how you fell in love with, uh, and how Howard and Cindy Wachowski also came to, to really value the, the creativity on its own terms of the Gutai works, not only Shimamoto, but, but Shiraga and others. You want to just push that a little further? Well, around the time because that Because I think you're being overly yeah. modest. I okay. mean, it's not just a painting or two, but it's the greatest collection of Gutai ever formed outside Japan. We had seen Shiraga work probably 10, 12 years ago. I was introduced to it at the same time, around the time that we saw the Shimamoto work by a friend in New York who is himself a collector and critic and sometimes a dealer, um, who's one of those maverick people who happens to be looking ahead of everybody else at works that are interesting. And we saw it, but really didn't have a way to focus it. And because the, the, the Rachowski collection, which is quite a significant and substantially scaled one is nonetheless not a massive collection, so mm -hmm. we couldn't be collecting in 20 directions at once. We didn't focus on it, and it was easy to not look at it because 12 years ago, it, 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 it was easier to see how this work related to abstract expressionism more than to its own context about mm -hmm. which we knew little. Mm -hmm. And it was easier to, to kind of not get comfortable with it mm -hmm. until we knew it better. But nonetheless, there, there, there remained this curiosity. And then quite recently, in the last few years, I think principally because a generation of American curators and dealers who did study in Japan and have focused on this material are now coming of age themselves and presenting it. It became quite clear to us that this, that there was a whole movement and a development that, um, that was meaningful for us to explore and that there were opportunities in the marketplace that might not be there for all that much longer. I think mm -hmm. pretty much concurrently, um, a number of museums from MoMA to the Tate and certainly with the work that, that, that you're doing in Abu Dhabi, became aware that, 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 we, that this bias had, in a sense, blinded us to, toward having a, a more comprehensive picture of art in the post-war period. Yeah. Um, somewhat concurrently, um, I, I, I've also been involved in Brazil because of another museum project that I'm involved with, and another collector I work with in Dallas, who is also donating her right. collection to the Dallas Museum of Art, named Didi Rose, became very interested through my introduction in um, Brazilian work in the post-war period that's coming out of a, a kind of mm -hmm. neo-concrete right. spirit. So, so what becomes clear in the post-war period is that, 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 that there, there's art happening across the globe that, right. that is coming out of similar roots, but coming to it from very specific local cultural sets of conditions, and we tended to create a hierarchy in our own minds that blinded us toward looking at a lot of it. And now all of a sudden, we're, we're seeing more of how these things interrelate and how they um, add up to telling a story rather than um, differentiate themselves as being localized and principally of, mm -hmm. of national interest. Um, what we've tried to do in the Rachowski Collection quite in a short period of time, recognizing that it was a moment of opportunity in the market, is to collect it meaningfully. And yeah. And meaningfully, it has been. Dorian, I'd love to uh, start with you. Uh, 
you know, how did you come to Japanese art? Um, uh, and if you could tell us about how you are deconstructing this hierarchy that uh, Alan's talking about at MoMA, because the work you're doing at MoMA is really extraordinary. And if you could share with us some of those initiatives. Mm. Well, <clears throat> the art historians who um, are coming out of the 1990s, um, you c couldn't could not not be affected by the change that was happening in academia, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so as just as globalization was changing the art market, I think that effect was also felt in, um, in the academia as well. So um, I was perhaps one of, the, uh, one of the graduate students going into art history um, that for whom the idea of modern art was beginning to change. Um, mm -hmm. Still, I think, in, in large part, um, of course, you, you just mentioned Yale and how they're thinking about world art history. And still, one could say that if you say modern art, then that still equals Western modern art. But I think the changes began to happen in the 90s mm -hmm. um, with specialists in whether, um, especially Japan, but um, also Latin America and other parts of the world uh, were coming out um, with their dissertations and finding academic positions. Um, you could say that the field still remains small, but uh, the change had already began in the 1990s. So this, con <clears throat> excuse me, this consciousness was already there. Um, and I guess being part of that generation, um, my, and, and part of it is my own cultural heritage, and I uh, was interested in, in, in learning more about what is the, the, the history, mm -hmm. the very complicated history of um, modern art, especially in East Asia. And you know, I have to say that the school that I chose didn't have a specialist. Um, I think we still have this only- This is Berkeley? Yes. Um, and, um, Quite amazing that Berkeley wouldn't have a specialist, yeah. Right, I mean, of, of course we had um, Chinese art historian and Japanese art historian, but their focus um, were in the traditional area. Um, pre-modern period, um, but uh, what was what was remarkable was that they um, were very open to the idea um, of somebody um, still receiving the more traditional training, but interested in um, opening a new field. And, you know, being part of opening a new field um, of modern and contemporary art history uh, in that region. So that's um, with how this my sort of global perspective. Right with, a, right, with a focus on East Asia. Right, mm -hmm. so that's how, I, uh, how, how it started for me. You know? And then there was a lot of grasping that was happening because there wasn't one or two professors who were um, leading me and you know, just uh, guiding me, but they were incredibly supportive um, in many ways. And then it also began to change once I became a curator and we started working for a museum. So Doreen was first at the Walker where he did a wonderful show on uh, Kudo Tetsumi. Right. Let's circle back and I want to come back and yeah. ask uh, what's happening at MoMA, but Mika, why don't you tell us also what, what was sort of the kikake, what was the, what was the start of all this, uh, and, and for your focus on, on Monoha. Well, I think it's, it's partially um, personal and all, you know, um, part of my kind of upbringing, um, being from Los Angeles, and um, I was born, my, my mother was an artist who came um, to the U.S. in the late 60s, 1967, and uh, there was a very, very small community of Japanese American and Japanese artists um, in Little Tokyo downtown Attraction Avenue area, in which he, she was very close with um, Sam Francis and uh, his wife Mako Idemitsu, and um, also this uh, Japanese American abstract painter uh, Mike Kanemitsu. So I grew up in a very kind of, you know, small artistic community, not really knowing exactly um, what this was about, but always very curious um, with the exchange between Japan and um, or Tokyo and Los Angeles. And, uh, and so, you know, within that upbringing, I slowly came to understand my own position um, you know, being brought up in the U.S. and but being very curious about the development history of uh, post-war Japan and um, and also just how I mean how artists really were living um, not just within um, like you know closed 
national um, context, but in a kind of more global mm -hmm. context. Um, so when I went, I also went to Berkeley and um, I actually, Dorian was a graduate student when I was undergrad and um, he was, be because there was a lack of uh, professors who were um, specialists in contemporary or post-war Japan, uh, I was, um, I had a double major in polit um, political science, international relations, and art history. And I focused on an artist named Yanagi Yukinori. Um, so this, he was uh, an artist from, he studied at Yale for his MFA, and his work really dealt with critiques of nationalism um, after the, um, the um, Emperor Hirohito died in 1989. So I was very interested in um, post-89 um, politics and, um, and it was very much the identity politics right. similar period in the US. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the works that um, I was very interested in, Yanagi was an early work, was this kind of land, it was an earthwork that was a floating um, balloon with, um, it, was, it was just um, wrapped around with, um, with earth and um, different kinds of um, materials that would float into different spaces. Mm -hmm. And um, his key inspiration for that work was Monoha. Mm -hmm. And so I was, began wondering what Monoha was. And so when I um, entered graduate school and was thinking about the, um, my dissertation topic, um, my advisor, who's Miwon Kwan, who just did the land art show in MoCA, um, was really you know, probing, you know, what is it about um, Japan? I mean, there's such a lack of materials um, mm -hmm. in English language. Um, and she really, discouraged me from uh, working on contemporary topic because there was just, it was all journalism and yeah. very, um, and not much really in terms of the mater publication material. So, um, and another aspect of uh, really having a very um, strong topic is to think about modernism. And so when you were talking about multiple modernities, um, what is, modernity for Japan and how do we define it within art historical context. And so um, Monoha was, and especially the key ideologue Liu Fan, who was um, uh, one of the key philosophers during that time, um, was very interesting to me because of the movement's um, very profound uh, critique of modern rationalism and kind of the ontological status of the object mm -hmm. and how that resonated with um, parallel movements, you know, mm -hmm. in Europe and U.S. Mm -hmm. and how it was also different from it as well. So um, mm -hmm. that's, you know, kind of a... <clears throat> Can, um, that's here. great. Let, um, I want to mm -hmm. come back after, now that we've had sort of the introduction to why now? What are the forces that are bringing this to the planetary alignment? And Mika, we've spoken about this reevaluation. Can you tie that into your, the studies that you're talking about? Um, you've mentioned that there is a, a reevaluation going on in Western studies on performance, on the body, um, and that this is kind of prompting also a reevaluation. Uh, you know, you mentioned a form. Can you talk a little bit about that? How this reevaluation that we're going through in the West about the 70s, 60s, and 70s, in your case, the 70s, is prompting this new appreciation of Japanese art? Well, I think that the 70s is a prime period art historically, you know, within the academy. Um, especially, you know, and also it filters into the institution as well. Um, and there is no real, I think, narrative yet. And there is, it is, as Paul Schimmel had pointed out, an age of pluralism. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, with Harold Zaman's very profound um, exhibition, um, When Attitudes Become Form, I mean, I think after his death, there were a lot of publications that came out um, that we were reevaluating his own legacy and his that that exhibition mm -hmm. um, over the last few years. Yeah. Um, and so um, there, were, the Tokyo Biennale, which happened in 1970, there were many of the same artists who were in um, Harold Zaman's show, 1968, and also or 1969, and then um, Anti Illusion, which was at um, in the new the new museum, and so I think that particular time um, has been a made a, a very kind of you know center of interest because there were so many um, artists who were working in this um, 
vein of site-specific and um, kind of ephemeral process-based mm -hmm. works. And, um, you know, I think that theoretically we're still at a moment when we're trying to figure out the, you know, categorization of that, those, those um, practices. Mm -hmm. And then recently with Documenta, I think that there is an a interest with, um, well, this object-oriented philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, our reevaluation re of um, not only current, our relationship with objects, but also um, in the current um, world, but also artifacts from the past and how, mm -hmm. um, I mean, this comes out of the culture of technology, um, which happened also, you know, during the time of Monoha and um, a very kind of rejection of that um, self-alienation self that was happening between man and nature. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, so... It's kind of a recuperation or... And what's also so amazing is that though those shows then had more Japanese artists and the Japanese shows had more, you know, um, international, you know, Western artists, including Artipovoda artists, mm -hmm. than shows again would have had in the ensuing 30 or 40 years. Dorian, do you want to comment on, on what Mika said and also give us your ideas of why now, why this confluence is happening? Mm -hmm. Do you agree with this reevaluation idea? Well, I think that's for sure. And it, it, clearly, this is coming out of the, the globalization of the art world and the art history as a discipline um, in general. Um, but I think we're also realizing that, oh, all this thinking has been done before. We're just doing it in different terms. So when you talk yeah. about retrenchment um, of the American museum world and the, um, or maybe Western in general, um, is, it, we're sort of... Uh, Actually, it was American. I think right, Europe was sort of American. pretty active yes. all along. So we're kind of revising that afterwards. And so I think we're all um, surprised by how international um, the museum thinking was in the yeah. 60s, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and MoMA has, when I was doing a bit of archaeology of uh, the history of MoMA's engagement with Japan, it was quite startling to, to see how, um, if it wasn't continuous, it was quite steady and regular and even deep. Um, it uh, goes back as early as 1954, 55, yeah. when we invited um, an, a modernist architect named Yoshimura Junzo, who's a very, um, well-respected and revered architect. And he came to MoMA and built a replica of the 17th century Japanese villa as an example of uh, vernacular modernism, which was, of course, an important idea that the institution was exploring at the time. And, that, uh, and then there was something major happening every decade. Um, and then there was the well-known show, maybe not so well-known, but 1965 and 1966, there was a big show called The New Japanese Painting and Sculpture, which you just mentioned, um, that Bill Lieberman organized with Dorothy Miller. Um, and it's incredible to think that they were really working in real time. Bill Lieberman went to Japan in November 1964, right after the Olympics um, in Tokyo, Summer Olympics in Tokyo, and spent um, a whole month there visiting hundreds of artists. And really, I mean, at that time, the art scene was definitely much smaller, so he completely surveyed um, and met pretty much everybody and then organized a show that had uh, more than 40 artists of the established generation as well as emerging generation. Um, and then there was another exhibition in 1974 called, <clears throat> excuse me, called New Japanese Photography that Jan Zarkowski did with another very important curator, Shoji Yamagishi. So, you know, this is the, these were the reasons why we even have um, quite robust collection of Japanese yes, objects. If do. it's not, a, um, if it is not a comprehensive one or even representative of all the developments that were happening in Japan in the post-war period, but we did get paintings and sculptures and very large collection of um, photography and architecture and design have done, the department has done amazing work of um, constantly adding, building the collection. <coughs> Excuse me. But it took so. until you to kind of, as you say, do the archaeology and kind of connect the dots. Um, well, uh, oh, I mean, it was a collective effort, ac yeah. actually. Even before I joined the museum about three and a half years ago, um, there was an internal workshop with visiting Japanese curators to see 
uh, what the institution has done in terms of exhibition history and the collection. And I think everyone was just startled mm -hmm. to see yeah. there are all these objects that have been, have been collected but have um, not been shown for a long period of time. Um, so this effort had already begun and people started talking interdepartmentally now that we're in this time period. And then uh, we realized that all these, the strands of internationalism have been um, woven into the long history of, uh, of MoMA, of, you know, that's now over 80 years. So, um, and it's not just Japan, it's I think, you know, Eastern Europe, and we're also discovering that there has been a, uh, there was engagement with, with even the Middle East and mm -hmm. South Asia. Um, so we're just pulling these strands out um, in Latin Amer America, of course, from the beginning of the, yeah. ins the institution. But Japan turned out to be definitely one of the um, countries or regions in the world that were very important in the, uh, the really formative period in, uh, in post-war history. Uh, within the museum. So it became kind of natural that Japan is a place that we have to focus our, one of the areas to focus our research and resources and an exhibition um, that I just did was uh, one of the outcomes of mm -hmm. that effort. Mm -hmm. So Alan, can you bring us to the market? Um, so we sort of heard what the, what the reasons are academically and institutionally. Um, what, 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 what's happening in the market and what, what why why all the excitement and the attention? I'd like what to just are the comment on one, one yeah. aspect of, of what Dorian was saying, which leads to the market, which is at the same time that MoMA has this ongoing periodic connection with art from Japan, it's telling that that art didn't enter the canon of the collection in a visible way, meaning we never saw Shiraga with, with Klein and Pollock, or we didn't see Gutai emulation to process art if Richard Serra and, and Eva Hesse and so on. So it still was kind of within its moment. What, 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 what makes the market focus on something that it knows is there but doesn't seem to be particularly interested in is a, is a kind of interesting and, and, and telling phenomenon. In general, the art market, I think, is pretty lazy until it really needs to gear up. And then when it gears up, it can be extremely efficient. Um, I think that the... The, the rise of interest in the market, let's start first with Gutai because that's wh wh where the market has more to get hold of, yeah. <laughs> um, however um, randomly. Um, it happens because opportunities <clears throat> are, are shrinking in terms of acquiring, <clears throat> of finding works to sell and to acquire in, of, of known masterworks, uh, first of American art, from this generation of the 50s going to the 60s. And, and now as prices rise for the European art, which we were ignoring for decades, but then started looking at again in the last 10 years, all of a sudden the market's gaze starts to go in another direction. So I think you have a confluence of, of, um, uh, of conditions. On the one hand, we have art historians, curators, who are bringing knowledge from this culture to the attention into the mainstream of the institutions. And at the same time, we have several dealers who have studied in Japan and had personal interest in it, now all of a sudden presenting exhibitions, <coughs> um, aligning with a market that has a rapidly decreasing supply of masterworks from mm -hmm. this post-war period and rapidly rising prices at mega levels. Yeah. Um, and all of a sudden people start looking and it's sort of just like a, like a village is running out of food and they go further out into the forest to look for things to feed themselves with. It's a very similar function within the art market. So all of a sudden, I mean, it's curiously in the last six months, but I've it's gotten- it's not just value, it's also there must be a sense of, I mean, the value is pretty extraordinary even as the value of, of this post-war Japanese material is rising, I mean, exponentially, it's still, compared to um, European and American art of the same period, um, and people who were showing in the same shows mm -hmm. and have a very similar, you know, historical uh, relevance uh, to, to, to a, even a world art history, it's still a vast gap. Of, it's a fraction, uh, but I will tell you that within the last year, I've had Chiragas offered to me at three times and four times the price 
that was being asked a year before. And I've probably had half a dozen dealers who had no link to this material before all of a sudden perk up and they hear Sharaga, Motonaga, they hear, I mean, a lot of good Thai is not all that, um, there's not that much to develop in terms of a commercial potential with certain of the artists, but certainly with Sharaga there is, you have five decades of great painting. Yeah. And with Motonaga, you, you, you have a substantial amount of work, mm -hmm. much, I don't know about much of which, but some of which was shown in France, sold, <clears throat> collected in European collections, you know, in the 60s and 70s already. So there, mm -hmm. there's material that can emerge. Um, and, and, and One dealer said to me, this is happening because contemporary art is boring. Well. <laughs> Which is a rather radical statement. Well, well, part of I don't subscribe to, but what do you think? Well, whether or not it's boring, it, 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 it's, th th there are great historical works from Gutai period um, by the major artists that are inexpensive compared to a lot of contemporary art by hot artists who have had a market of three years. And so there is an imbalance. And usually where, where the gaze of collecting broadens beyond the world it knows is when prices start to rise and then certain collectors who are working with limited budgets or with the desire to not spend above certain sums begin looking in different directions. The art market that I became involved, that not involved with, but through which I entered the art world in the early 80s, um, contemporary collectors collected contemporary art. When the price of Jeff Koons got so high, all of a sudden some collectors realized Richard Serra was less expensive than Jeff Koons. And so knowledge broadens as, as people get priced out of a market mm -hmm. or opportunities start to um, <laughs> um, shrink. So I think something similar is happening with why there are areas of interest. With Monoha, um, it, it, it's, you delivered on a silver platter an extraordinary presentation of, of a historical uh, movement that we didn't know about, that was even more closely connected and relatable to American and European art of the same time period. And within one show, there was the opportunity to, to put together a museum quality collection of an assembly mm, of works true at and prices that again were, 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 were highly affordable and at the same time there, there's the awareness that, that maybe this was a, this one exhibition that you did had a s significant percentage of potentially collectible major works by those artists. And so I think there was a greater sense of urgency on the part of some museums and ourselves with wanting to, um, to collect while the opportunity was there. So again, for those who just came in, that was Mika Yoshitake's show at Blum and Poe, which was a museum quality show, but it happened to be mostly for sale, which was remarkable. I'd like to turn to China and to sort of compare what has happened um, in this post-war Japanese art field to what we have seen recently um, in the uh, early 2000s, or let's say from 2007 to 2009 or so, happened with the Chinese market. Because there we had, um, I think what everyone now recognizes, something of a bubble where you know five or six artists, all of whom were let's say primarily painters, um, uh, achieved sort of astronomical figures very, very fast, largely through auction activity. Mm -hmm. um, the Sotheby sale of March 2007 really kind of took a group of artists from more or less nowhere as far as the West was considered and catapulted them into outer space. Um, and we have seen then the Chinese artists, some of these names kind of make their own product and um, kind of feed that market, which was which was fed a lot by what I call the cu cultural, I mean, of course, speculation on the market side internationally, but also quite a lot of speculation within China. Mm -hmm. And quite a lot of what I see completely absent in Japan, which is a sense of cultural nationalism, which of course can cut both ways. So in China, you have, even though the bubble, that particular bubble has burst, there's great work being done in China. The market has sort of resumed a normalcy. We're focusing again on a kind of a younger generation, thank goodness, like the great artist Liu Wei. Um, eh, but um, eh, how, how, do we, how do we kind of, you know, uh, compare the cultural nationalism and speculative, well, forget the speculation, the cultural nationalism that which is driving and sustaining very strong market forces in China still, even after the bubble, 
and Japan, where there's almost no domestic demand. Much of this activity for uh, the post-war Japanese art is happening outside, it's happening in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, Dorian, do you want to comment on that? Because I know you mm -hmm. bop back and forth between Japan and China a lot. Hmm. Well, as I guess as a museum curator, um, especially working for a museum that doesn't focus on either of these countries or even the region, um, it is always um, a, well, that's the, the sort of the crux of what we do, right? I mean, we're trying to contextualize whether it's Japanese works or Chinese works or wherever they come from, if they're not already part of the main narrative that you try to find linkage. And it's not just work that MoMA's doing or the Guggenheim's doing, but a number of serious institutions have been doing that. Um, the Walker um, was perhaps one of the first institutions that put Gutai and Arte Povera and Yves Klein all yeah. in the same collection gallery. You know, yeah. So these are the kinds of work that we um, are doing. And so that's, so let me pre preface this by saying that first. And then um, with China, I, I don't know yet. <laughs> but I guess one thing that I sort of thought a lot about uh, while working on this exhibition about the avant-garde in Tokyo in the 1950s and 60s is how this co combination of social, economic, and political factors um, is reminiscent of what has been happening in China yeah. um, in the last decade or so. Um, and that's not to simply suggest that... Can, um, you, can you go into that? Because that's very interesting, the parallels. Right. Well, you know, Japan, of course, we all knew that um, was a defeated, devastated country in 1945 when the war ended and when the Americans came in to occupy it for seven years. Um, from that point on to only in less than 20 years, by the beginning of the 1960s, is the second largest economy in the world, you know, and that's a truly remarkable historical phenomenon. And by 1964, less than 20 years, it's um, hosting the Summer Olympics, right, um, which really signaled the country's reemergence in the international arena and, and still uh, talked about within Japan as really important marker. And of course what China is, uh, is, is a completely different from that situation, but I think you can see a certain parallel mm -hmm. uh, between Japan and China. Um, Cultural Revolution and you know, uh, post Deng Xiaoping era, and then what happened since then, through from the 1980s on, and you know you could even say that the Beijing Olympics in 2008 and That's Shanghai true. Expo in 2010. Oh, because in Japan, right after Tokyo Olympics in 64, there was an expo um, in Osaka in 1970, and that's how. Japanese post-war history in the 1960s and 70s have talked about that these are the benchmarks, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so many other indicators that are around it um, really uh, constitute the golden era in mm -hmm. Japan. And in many ways, it feels very, uh, what's happening in China since the, uh, in the 2000s feel very similar to Japan in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. Of course, if, and if we're talking about the art world and the art market in Japan in the 1960s and China now, I think these are very different conditions. Um, the market in general, right, is just not the same thing, whether it's in Japan or China, but the, the art market in general is a completely different thing in the 60s and now. Um, but it's interesting to think about um, kind of certain post-historical conditions mm -hmm. um, that we are finding in these two dif um, different well, neighboring countries in two different decades and how the art market in general has changed and also the institutional scene has changed um, during that time and what are the convergences mm -hmm. and how um, these two things produce different conditions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very interesting parallel that I hadn't thought about before. I'm going to just ask if any of you have questions for each other, and then I want to turn it over to the audience. And if you want to prepare some questions, we will um, take them shortly. But um, Alan, do you have any questions for anyone on the panel? I or? just have one thought that I yeah. wanted to add to, to this issue, which is that when we went to Japan to try to begin our research on Gutai, it, we realized it was fairly invisible in Japan. While there has been a very active um, development of art in the last few decades coming out of Japan and a very active market, 
that market had no relationship or very little relationship right. to Gutai. So you're saying um, Murakami and Yoshitomo Nara, which was a phenomenon globally on the market mm -hmm. and art historically and art critically, did not have repercussions. You don't seem think? Seemed to be a completely different. I'm sure underlying that, that there are linkages we could create, but it wasn't visible. The dealers dealing in this material for the most part didn't know about Gutai yeah. material. There was no specialist in this. Maybe it had something to do with, with Gutai being an Osaka-based movement rather than a Tokyo-based one. Or maybe it's part of, um, I mean, I'd love to hear a little bit from Mika about this, Why? Wh whether this is a Japanese situation or a post-war Japanese situation where a movement from the 50s has been basically invisible. But even if you went to museums, there was one regional museum outside of Osaka that has a number of wonderful Gutai works, but the great collection, Hyogo, which has remarkable deep holdings, none of it's on view. Yeah. And even to get into the storage to see it is, is, is apparently quite difficult to do. So, mm -hmm. so it was not only invis invisible within an American market, it was invisible it wasn't visible within Japan itself, whether on the museum level or on the market level. So Mika, why do you think that is? Why has that been? I think, I mean, you know also, but I think there is this um, sense of self-criticism that has a very deep-seated kind of self-criticism that has happened historically within the post-war period and in relation to works, you know, practices in the U.S. And so there is that, I, I'm talking about um, Japanese critics and, you know, art historians who have always placed Japanese art against the me like measure, you know, the measure was American mm -hmm. and European art. And mm -hmm. so um, I, I think that, you know, there is this kind of self-devaluation mm -hmm. that tends to happen. Mm -hmm. And I can speak more about Monoha because, mm -hmm. you know, that's more my specialty, but um, there's, just no, the market does not did not exist, yeah. and there's just even the gallerists who you know um, I was working with, they didn't even really understand the value of right. Monoha. Um, I mean, I had to do a lot of groundwork in terms of locating these pieces in yeah. warehouse, you know, in storage spaces, and um, I don't think that there is a structure set at yeah. all, um, yeah. and. Even the artists themselves, I think, were so kind of pounded down historically because Monoha itself was such a controversial um, term mm -hmm. and movement mm -hmm. and, yeah. um, and just criticized for mm -hmm. a long time. I think until mm -hmm. now, I think it took someone outside to you know, value. Yeah. So that's basically what I, I would happened. say also that we're talking about, avant, you know, Zenge. We're talking about, you know, avant-garde groups in Japan where the salon fixture and bureaucracy and methodology and system of art, the academic system of art is still very strong. Mm -hmm. So that while you have monoha works that are being trashed in storage units, you know, on the 10th subway line outside Tokyo, um, you have Nihonga artists who no one in this room has ever heard right. of a single name going for millions of dollars yeah. Yeah. and yeah. used as political capital right. between the, um, the politicians mm -hmm. and, and upheld by the Ginza galleries, um, which has absolutely no international resonance whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Maybe it should, but I think the equivalent is in China. We, know we think that this contemporary art market in China is the dominant market. It's not. It's a fraction of the dominant market in China, which is, guess what? Ink. Um, modern and contemporary ink is what dominates and really is the engine of the Chinese art market. And it's the same with Nihonga. Um, but even also the, the classical yoga style or Western style painters in the Ecole de Paris, that's what the Japanese, you know, sort of, I think, uh, mainstream market still considers to be the mainstream market. And this material has really been, um, it, it, I mean, I think. In their defense, I think there are many Japanese museums that have done great works of scholarship and have provided the documentation that has been the basis of all of our research. Um, the anthologies are extraordinary, the bibliographies yeah. are extraordinary. You know, they're not keeping the works in the best condition, but I think that's also getting a little bit better. And hopefully that the attention that we're all bringing will help the Japanese to, you know, stimulate pride and, and, and ownership of this extraordinary um, work of modern and contemporary art that has so much to teach the world um, about modernity and the problems of, uh, of, of existence in a post-war post-war society when we were all struggling to understand the meaning of life and the purpose of art. Um, are, are there questions? <laughs>
I think we have you know, 10 minutes or so for some questions from all of you. I think they're mics if you want to wait for a mic to come, your, come, come around. Uh, this is a question for Mika. I'm putting my thoughts together as I go along. Uh, you had said earlier on, if I understood you correctly, that the historical narrative of Japanese art going back to the 70s had yet to be constructed. Forget about deconstruction of it. It's yet to be constructed, if I understood that correctly. And then you just recently said in the Japanese character, if I understood you correctly, there's a tendency towards uh, self denigration, self-devaluation. Could that be part of the reason, or I'd be interested in your own thoughts as to the reason for the failure of uh, a construction of a historical narrative of Japanese art, if I'm clear on my question? Yes. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think that's the reason why I am I, doing my work now is because there is this lack of you know, still I feel like a lack of um, at least English language scholarship, um, both in introducing but also in reevaluating, introducing Japanese art but also in reevaluating it on, in a more transnational context. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yes, it's been a difficult a challenge to translate. This, there's, this is a process of translation to translate some of the issues and contradictions um, that have gone on. Um, his art has, like basically art historically in Japan, but also art historically that have happened in the U.S. I mean, I'm trained as an American art historian, but you know, there's a different kind of discourse in Japan, and so to bridge those two together is very, you know, it's it's not easy, um, and so that's I think finally now, you know, I, I that that is something that is my long-term project is to be able mm -hmm. to. Um, bring in those two histories together in terms of, you know, um, in a museum context or even, you know, um, kind of academically. So. Sorry, could you talk into a mic? Because we're recording. Preliminary question for, for you. I put too much pressure on you, but do you have any thoughts of your own in regard to the substance of that historical narrative? Um, well, I mean, there are many different angles that I'm questions about. Um, I, I tend to think more philosophically, I guess, and so it's it's not a specific, um, you know, concrete. But there's you know questions about reevaluating our um, connections to space or even to you know um, otherness, um, and. And also about materiality and how that affects the way that we relate to objects, you know, in a more global context. I mean, there's. I don't know what I don't know what kind of answer you're trying to. I, I, I'm um, just going <laughs> to attempt one last comment, which it seems extremely simplistic, but it's one that I've also asked the Japanese for many many years. You know, what you don't have in Japan that we we have here across the field is private collectors who are supporting this material first. I mean, the dealers are the front runners. Um, museums come late <laughs> uh, in, uh, oftentimes, uh, and the academy comes last. Um, and in Japan, there's no space. Where, I mean, they're literally, houses are small. I know that seems ridiculous, but actually, it's a fact. Um, so the people in Tokyo who might have been the sponsors of this, the few that there were, were in an extraordinary situation, extremely wealthy individuals who had uh, uh, houses that they somehow inherited, like, you know, Hara Toshio. There, there aren't that many individuals like that. There's a very rough tax system in Japan. There's a very high taxation on wealthy individuals. You just... I, I honestly think you didn't have that class of private collectors to kind of keep this buoyant to wait for museums. And you, you, know, you also don't have the, the philanthropic tradition in Japan at all um, to donate these works to museums where they would be preserved and where they would incite scholarship the way um, that the Brachowski collection is. So I think there's, there's a lot of structural differences in Japan that have prevented this uh, uh, care and scholarship from maturing as well as it might. Um, 
A any other question from the audience? Jack, nice to see you. Uh, right here. And why don't you introduce yourself? I'm not good at that. <laughs> That's Jack Dilton, who's been showing this material for a long time. Um, it seems that there are often uh, forgotten sections of our history. In Japan, you, you, we, we, you haven't mentioned um, High Red Center or Experimental Workshop. Pre-political pop in China, there's Star Star. Maybe you could comment on some of that. Dorian? Mm -hmm. you want, yeah, Doring's show has a very strong focus um, on High Rate Center and mm -hmm. Jiken Kobo Experimental Workshop. Do you mm -hmm. want to comment on, in what context, Jack? Give him back the mic. You're just doing a beautiful job. Just whatever, you, whatever you'd like to say. It's, 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 <laughs> you know, that our, stuff's our, our, really hard to, to collect. No, but art is a wonderful <laughs> thing. It, it gets for, sometimes chunks of it get forgotten for no reason. So okay. maybe just talk. Mm. Do you want to talk about your interest in right. this material was in Screaming Against the Sky too, got forgotten again and coming back. Would, uh, can you tell us what your interest yeah. was in that? Right, so Chicken Kobo. And maybe explain to people Right, what Experimental it is. Workshop was um, an artist collective of 14 individuals, which included three visual artists, but um, the majority of them were actually musical composers and musicians and also there was uh, an engineer and a lighting designer. So it was quite um, an incredible multidisciplinary um, group, which I uh, think of I think of them as coming together in large part because of the, the lack of infrastructure at the time. They were in existence from 1951 to about 1958, um, and in the almost complete absence of contemporary art museum and, or gallery structure to support um, uh, the more experimental kind of work. They had to come together as a collective. Um, some of the galleries like Takaishi and, um, and, and David Judah have been showing some of the work from um, Jiken Kobo. So it's the, some, some materials and of course, um, uh, Yokota Shigeru Gallery in Tokyo has been working with them. Um, but the two other galleries that I just mentioned have really brought them out to the international art market more recently, not that they're all, all that well exposed. Um, but he, historically what is also interesting is that you know, we uh, are now familiar with the whole story of the French critic and curator Michel Tapie coming to, uh, to Japan in 1957 and 58 and discovering Gutai <laughs> and he was the very important bridge figure mm -hmm. to between Japan and especially the European market. He did try with the American market and then that failed. Um, he helped organize uh, the first Gutai group exhibition at Martha Jackson Gallery, which was completely panned. Um, but in Europe, he had much more luck. So that's another interesting story. I, I'm going kind of going off a little bit here, but I think it's also interesting that um, when Richard Flood organized um, Arte Povera exhibition, Zero to Infinity in 2002, um, he told me later that um, all these Arte Povera artists knew about Gutai artists because these, so this is another um, instance of these connections. It, it, they're not just parallel, right? That there are concrete connections between Japan and Europe and also Japan and the United States mm -hmm. and there are many stories about that. But anyway, the reason why I'm mentioning Tapie is he's always connected to Gutai, but he um, was exposed to the Tokyo art world when he came and um, paid his attention to Jiken Kobo as well. He uh, wrote several articles about how innovative they were and whatnot, but that didn't translate to, um, to the art market. So, um, so from that point on till pretty much now, you know, almost half a, dec uh, half a century that um, Jiken Kobo didn't really enter um, not only the art market but also our discourse and um, some of their work is now has been included in various exhibitions only in the last couple of years. Yeah, yeah. Or, um, a year. Hmm? or a year. Or a year. <laughs> um, and High, High Red Center is another interesting example. It's another artist collective from 1963-64. Their existence was very short. Um, they were uh, performative in much of their work, um, very kind of ironical, satirical kind of actions. Um, but there, many of them 
only exists now in documentation. Yeah. Just a couple of the actions have um, relics or um, props or objects that are related to them. Um, and I guess most of them are, I mean, there are very few of them. Some, most of them are, I guess, now in museum collections in Japan and also in the States. Mm -hmm. But they were also, but their cases are slightly different. Um, they were early on uh, thought of as kind of outlier or even predecessor of, uh, of Flexus by George Machunas. So uh, they, they, in a sense, have been part of the art history for a long period of time. And I think, at least for me, well, not just for me, but I think the reason why their work um, is becoming more interesting, at least for museums, is because of more um, current phenomenon of interest in performance in museum in general. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a really, really important point, is that the uh, great interest, I mean, with Marina's show at MoMA, yeah. Tino Sogal at Guggenheim, it, it, there's just a, a lot of activity also in Europe, the Whitney Biennial this year, which had a whole floor devoted just to performance. Um, this renewed interest coming back to Mika's thesis that it's a part of a reevaluation, that in that space of reevaluation, we are being led again to the post-war Japanese avant-garde, um, which were known. I mean, many of these artists made these activities, as Dorian is reminding us, were known. They, was, they had cult status at the time internationally, either through right. Martunis or through Alan Capro or right. through uh, Michel Tapier um, or through Jean Clay in, in, in France. But somehow, again, in a process it, that we have our institutional amnesia set in. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Yes? Robert Rosenkrantz, <laughs> are you allowed to ask a question? <laughs> uh, this, this is a question for uh, Alan. So uh, you've indicated that the uh, you've indicated that the Rashovsky collection is destined for uh, the Dallas Museum, and I'm curious if if the collectors or you have any particular expectations. Uh, for what the museum is is uh, going to do with the collection, how they're going to build on it, uh, and whether you might be able to share those thoughts with us. There are three collectors, um, the Rachowskis, the Roses, and Marguerite, now the late Robert Hoffman, who together decided to uh, pledge their collections to the museum to uh, pass to the museum upon their deaths. Um, this grew out of a, a collective um, commitment to Dallas as a major city and toward a common interest in expanding local awareness of and interest in uh, post-war and contemporary art. The nature of Dallas is such that unlike some other communities in the United States where collecting tends to happen in teams, like some cities, if a de Kooning show gets done, then five people buy de Koonings. Uh, in Dallas, everyone prides themselves on their own individuality, on pursuing their own path. While at the same time, these three couples were aware that, that, that their, the individual routes they're taking in their collections start to add up to something that also um, augments and expands upon what it is that the museum owns. So I would say for at least 12 years, our discussions amongst ourselves, and there have been very collective conversations, have been always been with a mind toward what the museum owns and doesn't own. And the conversations have also been deeply involved with the museum curators and directors who have been there, uh, current director and previous director, Jack Lane. Um, Jack, when he came to the museum, declared that um, one of his primary goals was for the Dallas Museum of Art to create a definitive collection of postmodern sculpture. This was, um, this was in acknowledgement that Ray Nasher, a local collector and patron who created his own museum directly across the street from the Dallas Museum of Art, was probably the, formed the finest private collection of classical modernist sculpture. So that thought was building upon a local um, lineage within collecting. And similarly, um, the, 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 this group of collectors and, and hopefully now next generation collectors also think about forming their collections as, while on the one hand be pursuing their own personal passions, on the other hand, being something that connects to 
adds to and contributes meaningfully to the community at large. In truth, um, a substantial number of the Gutai and Monoha works that we've been acquiring over the last couple of years have been in collaboration with the Dallas Museum of Art. We bought them jointly. So, um, so that, that's an unusual situation where, um, where, where there's a very close interconnection between the patrons and the curators and hopefully um, unlike the fear that exists in many museums that, that trustees may um, overstep in terms of um, placing their own personal collecting interests into the, the um, um, into the agenda of the institution. I think here, here it's, it, 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 it's, a, it, it's a very different kind of situation. Mm -hmm. where and and don't you have two curators and one devoted to this material? Correct. Which will also ensure its future. I um, just want to sum up a little bit what we've all been saying um, to answer the question of our panel of why this interest in post-war Japanese art now. And I think what we've heard is the rise of globalization uh, as, a, as a philosophy, as a practice, as a reality. Um, the growth of scholarship that has come out of that and a younger generation building on a work done in Japan as well as early work here in the United States. Um, a reevaluation coming out of current interests in contemporary art um, and the scarcity of materials, which reminds me there's an art fair on. <laughs> um, so thank you all very, very much and thanks to Art Basel for organizing this and um, have a good day. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.